My name is John Fanning. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Integrity Risk International. It is a global um, enhanced due diligence and investigations firm. And it is, uh, uh, we, we have extensive experience helping businesses navigate a wide spectrum of needs um, and to achieve, hopefully to achieve positive outcomes. So I'm co-hosting today with Tara Gianta, who is a partner and vice chair of Paul Hastings Investigations and White Collar Practice. Paul Hastings is a leading international law firm and Tara and her team advise corporations in the area of ESG and human rights. Um, we are very fortunate to have a great group of experts with us today with an in-depth uh, practice and experience in developing and implementing effective programs, policies, and procedures to help their companies and employees um, incorporate uh, you know, and, and incorporate and operate with co confidence. Um, I'd like to go over a few house housekeeping items with you guys. Um, this is a 90 minute presentation. We have five panelists, so uh, there's a lot to go through. Tara and I will do our best to keep everyone on schedule. Um, we have reserved 15 minutes at the tail end of the presentation to address questions. Um, those questions can be asked in the Q&A section, which is down at the bottom of the Zoom meeting screen. Um, you can find it via the link towards the bottom. If you don't see it, just move your court cursor around there and it should come up and appear. Uh, there, um, then at the end, we will address these. Questions can be asked anonymously, um, but if you do ask an anonymous question and we don't get to it, answer it within the uh, Time, a lot of time, um, we won't be able to respond to it. But if you do put your name and contact information, we'll get back to you with that. Um, outside of that, the presentation will be recorded and everyone will receive a copy of it, everyone who's attended. And so you will get uh, a summary of it and we'll send out an email with that so you can um, review it or share. And I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. And then we'll get started. Anything else I left off, anybody? Nope, I think that's good. Thanks, John. Fantastic. So let's get started. As more and more companies are working to raise awareness uh, and implement changes, and they're pledging to um, adhere to the laws, regulations, standards around human rights and ESG, there's a great need to understand the market and how others are operating in this space. We will be speaking with, a pan with our panel about ESG considerations for their respective businesses and their organizations, why they think it's important, what they are doing to safeguard their programs against risk in these areas. And um, we're, they, they have been kind enough to take the time out of their busy schedules to speak to us um, and get, tell us about the actions they've taken and present those things to us and make sure that they are complying with, the, in, with these international laws and standards. Some of the laws and not all of them are the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, the UK Modern Slavery Act, Australian Modern Slavery Act, the European Union Conflict Minerals Regulations that are coming up, California Transparency Act, um, a lot of uh, for, in supply chain. And so this is just a short list. There's others in France and Brazil that, we've, that, that are also new. Um, so we're lucky to have this group and it is a timely topic. I'd like to first start off with a unique perspective. This is someone that doesn't come from the business world, but has a very good um, insights into the area of human trafficking. She's dedicated her, her life and her work to helping victims and to also educate folks about that. That is Sister Anne Victor Victory. She is the Director of Education for the Ohio-based nonprofit, The Collaborative to End Human Trafficking. And uh, with that, Sister Anne, I will give the floor to you. Hello, I'm delighted to be with all of you today. Um, and I'll share a little bit about where we're coming from on this issue. I'm a nurse by profession. So one of the ways I look at human trafficking is from that perspective as a, a public health issue and a major one. However, our collaborative to end human trafficking was founded in 2007 and started out really as a bunch of women religious in Cleveland area in Ohio. And we heard the term, had never heard it before, were pretty shocked by it, and decided somebody should be doing something about this. So we met until we figured out what it is that we could do best. 
So that's how our mission came about, which is to educate and advocate for the prevention and abolition of human trafficking while connecting services for, on, on behalf of trafficked persons. So we didn't see ourselves as the direct care providers, but each of us had networks of people from our own professions. So being a nurse, I have some healthcare connections. We had attorneys around the table. We had a lot of educators around our table. We had social service providers around the table. So we knew if we could help them understand that they're already seeing victims, then perhaps we could do a better job together to address the issues and the needs. We uh, currently are working with over 60 local regional agencies and organizations and businesses in the greater Cleveland area to weave that safety net. So it's, it's a, an ongoing effort. We are always uh, inviting and uh, interviewing and learning more about the organizations and their particular needs. In our education pres presentations, we always address labor trafficking as well as sex trafficking. Sex gets all the headlines, but labor is very, very important. So we, we are doing that and uh, we're happy to continue that mission. It's evolved over time, but it really has really gotten much more in depth rather than uh, more deeply expansive. So that's our focus. We're happy to be doing the work and we are grateful to have so many people now becoming interested in the fact that this is happening. And that's, that's one of the major things that we've learned. People yeah. didn't know when we started and now people at least have heard the term and they still may think it happens over there somewhere, but they're learning that it happens right in our neighborhoods. So thank you, I'm glad to be with you today. Thank you, Ann. Yeah, we, Sister Ann, uh, we, we are excited to have you here too. And we think, you know, we wanna bring a human element to it. And I think all of the professionals on this call I've worked hard to try and raise awareness as well. And, you know, next um, we've got with us, uh, we're very fortunate to have with us um, David Yaman, and David is the Executive Vice President and General Counsel of PepsiCo. Um, David, do you want to introduce yourself and take it from there? Yeah, sure. Thanks, John. Great to be here with everybody. And, uh, um, you know, it's a great topic. And, and I, I, I hear the sister speak about her mission, and I applaud it. And, uh, you know, when I think about some of the global issues that we all confront and we all focus on, and there's there's a wide range of them, you know, I'm reminded that it takes um, everybody everywhere uh, to work on these issues, to be aware of these issues, and ultimately do what they can to be a part of the solution and make the world better. Uh, and frankly, it's the reason that I worked at PepsiCo for more than 20 years now, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of the senior management team where you really get to help set strategy and and frankly, take the existing company values and do what you can to continue to shape them and focus them on the issues that matter the most. Um, you know, we're a consumer brands company. We work all around the globe. We're in 200 different companies and our supply chain, you know, has an equal reach. Uh, we have 270,000 employees and we stand as the second largest food and beverage company in the world uh, and the largest food and beverage company in, in the U.S. Um, and I say all that just because it's always been uh, a top of mind for us internally um, that we have a certain scope and scale and expertise and reach um, you know, that has a place to play and be a cause for good uh, to make the world better. And we, uh, we accept you know, the responsibility that we have uh, as a company and frankly, we embrace it as an opportunity. And I can say there's a lot of people on our teams uh, in all parts of the world that frankly work at PepsiCo because they have an opportunity not just to work on some great brands and and to create great products, and, and that's all good and fine. Um, but it, really the purpose part uh, of, of what in, uh, engages our employees is the ability to leverage all of PepsiCo um, in many places around the world to do better. Um, you know, we had a prior uh, CEO, Indra Nui, that set us on this path uh, a long time ago. In 2006, uh, she launched a strategy that she called Performance with Purpose. Uh, and at that time, it was really an effort to take some smallish initiatives within PepsiCo and ultimately build it into something that was bigger and grander and more comprehensive uh, and frankly had, had more um, connectivity. Uh, at the time, I'm not exactly sure if everybody knew where this was all going, uh, but it was important to kind of rally us internally uh, and get us focused on what ended up being three big buckets for us, which were planet, um, people, and product. 
uh, and I'm, you know, I'm sure those make some degree of logical sense in terms of planet. It's the water and the carbon and our agricultural supply chain. And then on the product for us, it's about reducing salt, fat, and sugar and trying to increase positive nutrients. And on the people front, it's everything from our own internal employee safety to the human rights within our supply chain um, to, uh, to even doing better in the communities and strengthening our communities. And importantly, at that time, it was critical for us because we're so big and vast uh, we had work to do just to set up the internal infrastructure to be able to measure what our impact was on all these different dimensions and actually set ourselves up to actually centralize some of that knowing or that not knowledge and that we operate so locally it can be hard sometimes to kind of generate all the, the data uh, and the insight even within our own operations so there was a lot of infrastructure build over the next you know 10 to 14 years now uh, we've done just that and it's continued to evolve every year and i've been i've been frankly proud to see how it's just grown uh, you know, we formalized our first sustainability office, um, you know, several years ago, uh, about 2016. At the same time, we formed chief human rights officer and a human rights committee. Um, and in 2017, we really stuck a flag in the ground um, and we created a board level committee, a distinct board committee that was focused on uh, this committee of our board of directors, focused on sustainability uh, and public policy. Uh, and that was a critical Thing for us internally because it really uh, it showed everybody internally and externally how serious we were and how integrated this was into the business strategy. Uh, in 2018, we got a new CEO, Ramon LaGuarta, who took over for Indra uh, and very distinctly didn't want to, uh, frankly, change direction on anything that Indra had put into place through the performance with purpose uh, strategy. He just took it and tweaked it a little bit as, as new CEOs are prone to do and just to refresh it. So now we call it winning with purpose, but it's got an equal degree of scope. It's got an equal degree of commitment. Um, and I would say that we've actually become a bit more focused on the need for a sustain world's need for a sustainable food system, uh, which I think still encompasses all the things that I mentioned before. But we're really, we're really we are really tr trying to focus on where we can have the greatest impact. Um, and the difficult part sometimes is looking at all the things that have to be done, all the problems in the world and trying to bring your oomph and trying to bring the resources that we have into as many places as you can, but not trying to diffuse all of your energy and resources so much so as to minimize your impact against a, a number of things. And so that's a very difficult balancing thing for us. We're doing a lot across a number, number of fronts, but we're trying to galvanize our focus around a sustainable uh, food system. Um, this needed extra uh, attention for us. Um, and so we appointed our first sustainability officer uh, just last year in 2019 and literally just a month ago uh, in the wake of some things that were going on, on the people front, namely the call for you know, racial equality acutely here in the US, but frankly, gender equality around the world. Uh, we took that board commit committee that had sustainability uh, as its almost sole focus and we added to that um, diversity and put that into the title of the community because we wanted to shine a brighter light, not just on sustainability, but in diversity. So look, the um, the story continues. It's a story of evolution and kind of continuous improvement and stuff. But we, we've been on board of the train for a long time and we continue to be with all the work that we all have to do, uh, holding hands and trying to do better around the world. So it's great to be here. Thanks, John. Absolutely. No, thank you. And, and uh, you know, a couple of things that uh, performance with a purpose is a great, uh, a, a great uh, message. And um, I also like, you know, I think, uh, you know, with looking at sustainability, our next guest is someone who has a lot of experience in, in, in that area as well. Um, I'd like to welcome another panelist, Sally Sears, who we're fortunate to have with us. She is the former vice president of ethics and compliance for Tyson Foods, another company that's uh, globally recognized for um, food and, uh, and, and for you know, uh, having done many things like that. So Sally, I'll hand it off to you. Tell us a little bit more about your program and your experience, thanks. Good afternoon. Thank you, John and Tara, for having me here today. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Um, just a little bit about my background. I spent about 20 years in private practice focused on commercial litigation and government investigations. And at my time at Jenner and Block in Chicago, I had an introduction to human trafficking through one of my partners, Martina Vandenberg, who for two decades has focused um, some of our, the firm's extensive pro bono work on victims of human trafficking and ultimately left the firm and founded the Human Trafficking Legal Center. 
And at that time, um, as Sister Ann prefaced, it was a lot of focus on sex trafficking, sometimes domestic servitude. And over time that has really evolved into a focus on forced labor, which is one of the things um, that Tyson and other companies who are um, uh, uh, employing migrant workers are dealing with on a global basis. And so today I'm going to talk um, about my experience in the ESG and human rights areas based on the programs at Tyson, some of Tyson's business partners, as well as my time as outside counsel. Um, at Tyson, the goal is to raise expectations for the good that food can do and the health and safety of its 139,000 employees is a top priority. And in support of that mission, Tyson has developed programs and made commitments focusing on ESG and human rights. Tyson has a robust sustainability program, has had a sustainability chief sustainability officer who sits at the executive level for several years now, has published an extensive sustainability report, um, which is, is really a great read and very uh, exciting and motiv motivated me to join Tyson when I was uh, considering the position because it really sets out in great detail uh, the good work that is being done on a number of fronts, including uh, the environment and also human rights, which we're, we're talking about here today. And Tyson has uh, signed on to as a signatory to some of the key human rights pledges, um, the UN pledges and here in the United States, the national pledge by transportation leaders against human trafficking. Um, you may see a lot of Tyson trucks on the highway. Um, we have uh, the company has a significant uh, transportation uh, component to its business. And so that for, for the company and for us was an important pledge to make uh, because often those frontline transportation workers uh, interact with and have the opportunity to identify victims of human trafficking. You know, and as I mentioned, Tyson and many other U.S. Company, companies employ significant number of migrant workers in their domestic facilities here. Uh, some of Tyson's facilities truly are a melting pot. You may have dozens of languages being spoken in a facility on any given shift. And like many generations before ours, often immigrants are encouraged by friends and family to settle in the same communities in the United States. Here in Northwest, excuse me, here in Northwest Arkansas, where I am, where Tyson, JB Hunt, and Walmart are headquartered, there's a significant population from the Marshall Islands. And even here, some of our social services and civic organizations uh, provide those services in Marshallese to support that very specific community. But Often we see that these migrant workers um, are poorly educated and even illiterate in their native language, which puts them at risk for human rights violations, such as improper recruiting fees and you know, retention of documents, identity documents improperly. So given the needs of this very uh, uh, at-risk workforce, Tyson over the years has built out many programs processes and controls addressing potential human rights violations in its operations, but also in the community in which we operate. Um, this is really a cross-functional effort. Um, as Dave was saying, it really ta it takes a village. It takes your HR, it takes your ethics and compliance, it takes operations, it takes corporate social responsibility, those key relationships in the communities. Um, and at Tyson, there's a, a special uh, program for chaplains. Um, there's a chaplain that services every facility, corporate and operational, and they are there as liaisons with our migrant worker population as well. And in my personal opinion, I think um, those community partnerships are key, um, whether you're in the United States or you're abroad, um, because those really help uh, get the trust of your workforce because often uh, people who may be victims of human trafficking or forced labor um, are scared. They don't understand their rights and they need to have those trusted resources who are often those community liaisons to help them through the process to understand their rights and take action as needed. Um, over the past several years, Tyson has expanded its operations globally. 
and now makes food in 10 countries over three continents and sells food all over the world. And that expansion really brings those non-US human rights requirements, some that John was mentioning in the UK and in other places, really to the forefront. And like many companies, Tyson continues to build and strengthen its governance and its structure around the programs that it has in place and to continually improve on them as the company's operations expand. Great, Sally, thank you. I, and I think one of the things that you said is really a, a great transition to this next to our next guest. You mentioned that it takes a village. I think actually, you know, it, it, it takes a global effort in many respects because your operations are global, PepsiCo, their operations are global. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, and it, it really a lot of the criminals and the bad things that are going on in the world are global as well. So um, our next guest I, I'd like to introduce um, to you is Manuel Vasquez Torres, who is the Compliance Senior Manager and Gloria Alba, who's the client's risk and operations analyst, um, both leaders at Industrial Industrious Put Mignoles. And this is one of Mexico's largest companies. It's focused on mining and extraction. So we're real lucky to have them. And we do get kind of a, another um, perspective from their, them as well. So Gloria and Manuel, um, thank you. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation, John, and, and the panelists and the audience you have. It's really a privilege to be accompanying you all and sharing the, uh, all the practices we've been performing for the time and in and, and a company and the industry uh, we've been participating in. There is an, an industry which needs to be, you know, readdressed. And, uh, you know, in order to uh, be perceived uh, as one of responsible industries which are part uh, and are raw materials for other uh, for, for other companies you know mining is uh, in every part in everything you use the planes we fly in the computers we use the devices we we use you know mining is everywhere and, and that's why it's important to uh, you know locate at the industry in the proper uh, 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 you know proportion so um Periolis is uh, a company founded in 1957 one of the most traditional companies in mexico uh, with more than 100 years uh, 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 of, of permanence and the mining, uh, mining metal uh, industry and mining metal, uh, metal sector in Mexico, which is one of the largest company worldwide, uh, are uh, producing uh, precious metals and non-precious metals, uh, non-ferrous metals, uh, excuse me, and chemical products uh, for, other, uh, for other companies as a raw material for other uh, industries. So uh, it is uh, really uh, well uh, committed with, uh, with its core values, which is confidence, responsibility, integrity, and loyalty. And part of this, uh, I'm building confidence and building trust uh, towards stakeholders. Uh, among those stakeholders are uh, the communities we work along with in a harmonious way, the environment, and of course, uh, uh, you know, clients, the vendors, and, 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 and investors. So uh, sustainability, uh, sustainability management is part of the core uh, uh, you know, uh, parts uh, of 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 this uh, of the strategy is actually uh, uh, Pinolis holds a ten pillar strategy, uh, we, uh, and part of the of those ten pillars, there are four uh, main pillars which are focused on uh, environmental sustainability and human resources uh, matter. There's a labor, stat labor strategy, which is really addressed and focused on these labor matters against human trafficking, you know, uh, looking for so, uh, social and healthcare and, uh, and either uh, and other things uh, over uh, five lines of actions, which is education, culture, health, safety, uh, there is a sustainability strategy uh, uh, that uh, which is focused on generate value and trust among our stakeholders. Uh, we're adhered, uh, we're added to to different uh, worldwide uh, uh, compacts and sustainable development uh, goals. For instance, the 2030 agenda of the sustainable sustainable development goals. And uh, 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 and well, and with more than 50, uh, 15 uh, thousand uh, employees and workers, uh, most located in Mexico, 
but uh, with other uh, projects in, in, in other parts. So I don't know if Gloria, which, who is my co-panelist, uh, want to add uh, some additional information about who we are, who, uh, who Pinales is, and, uh, and the importance and, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, the impact uh, which yeah. has in this ESG matters and HR uh, matters. Yeah, thank you, Manuel. Uh, I will give you um, to the audience a um, brief introduction so they can understand the scope of operations of Peñoles. Peñoles has its own mines and a refinery in Mexico. It also has uh, exploration projects in Peru and Chile and commercial offices in the US and Brazil. And to give like a dimension of the operations of Peñoles, I can say that it is the top world's producer of refined silver. It is the ninth producer of refined zinc. In the Americas, it is the leader, leading producer of metallic bismuth. And in Latin America, also the leader, leading producer of refined gold and lead. So as you can imagine, complying with all these ESG and um, ESG standards is not easy because the supply chain is complex. So our participation in this panel will be focusing in uh, explaining uh, Peñoles efforts to comply with its standards. We will also uh, give a little detail, detail about the um, challenges that we face and how the compliance function plays a key role to overcoming them. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria and Manuel. That's great. And uh, yeah, I think it brings a unique perspective. I know that one of the things that uh, is, I've admired about uh, Peñoles is the sustainability report that you guys put out every year. And, um, you know, and I think that that's very valuable. It's both in English and in Spanish and uh, folks can take a look at it. Next, we have someone else who has some excellent experience, um, also from Paul Hastings, um, but uh, is Jonathan Drimmer. And Jonathan um, is a partner at Paul Hastings. He's in litigation department, but he is the former chief compliance officer at Barrick Gold. So Jonathan uh, is a leading expert in this area. So he also has um, a, a lot of experience in the mining industry as well. So Jonathan, you want to take it from there and give an introduction? Yeah, sure. Thanks, John. No, thank you very much. And, and uh, thank you for having me. And, and thank you to all, all the other panelists. Uh, it's terrific, terrific to be, uh, to be on the screen with you. Um, so as you mentioned, John, uh, I'm a partner of Paul Hastings. I've been there almost uh, going on two years. I also wear several other hats. I, I'm a senior advisor at the social consultancy BSR, I'm an advisor to the Secretariat of the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights, and I'm the North American advisor to the Global Business Initiative for Human Rights. So I do spend a lot of time focusing um, on business and human rights issues and ESG within my practice. As you mentioned, the former chief compliance officer, deputy general counsel for Barrick, where I help set up and drive uh, their business and human rights and corporate integrity uh, business ethics program. I'm also a former federal prosecutor and started my career doing impact litigation about uh, 5,000 years ago uh, for an NGO um, and, and so have really spent most of my career in and around the issues that, that we are talking about. Uh, but, but really to try to come back to where you started, John, in setting the context, <clears throat> we have just seen an incredible rise in ESG related demands it, it, for the past five years. If you really go back to about 2016, I've been working in this space, I said, for more than 15. Um, last five years has just been a blizzard of activities. And you have a number of transparency laws, some of which you mentioned, whether it's the UK and the moder or, or the uh, uh, Australian Modern Slavery Act. Canada has a bill that's probably going to get passed next year. Uh, mandatory diligence laws. These are on the rise. The French duty of vigilance law, which you mentioned. That's child labor law. There's a new Swiss law that looks like it's going to be coming into, into place uh, in 2022. You mentioned the EU conflict minerals regulation that comes into, into, into effect in a couple of weeks. The EU legislative directive, which is probably going to be a transformative bit of mandatory diligence. We have it in the sanctions and penalties areas as the Global Magnitsky, Magnitsky Act now is, is uh, uh, issuing sanctions uh, for sanctions against um, individuals and entities who commit gross human rights abuses and corruption. Seven countries have adopted it. The EU this week is probably gonna adopt its own version. It's, it's a secret, um, but we think that's gonna happen in a couple of days. We've had uh, an amendment in the last few years to the, to the, uh, the Tariff Act, the US Tariff Act, and it's leading customs and border protection to seize goods <clears throat> at the border that they suspect are being created with forced labor 
and litigation going on all over the world in a number of different national Supreme Courts around a number of different ESG issues, whether it's human rights or climate uh, or, or, or other topics. Big focus is on privacy. Obviously, diversity in workforce and boards is a huge issue. Climate is a huge issue. And, and all of this blizzard of activities has caused companies, as you're hearing today, and, and, and this is something that Tara and I do uh, on a daily basis, to put into place, help put in place systems and processes in a programmatic way to try to deal with the growing expectations and demands of these ESG related risks. And whether it's a governance system, policies and procedures, more due diligence and assessment uh, efforts, training, uh, systems of hotlines and grievance mechanisms, transparency approaches, and, and putting into place the infrastructure that leads for accurate and transparent reporting, you're seeing real efforts by companies across sectors across the globe to try to put into place management systems and processes to try to deal with these rising demands and, and expectations. Absolutely. And, and thank you, Jonathan. That's, that's good information. And I think um, we've got a great panel, as you guys can see. We're very excited about it. I'm going to hand it off to my co-host, uh, Tara, if you want to um, fill in any gaps that we had there. And, uh, and But before I do that, I just want to say, Jonathan, you've held up really well for 5,000 years, uh, that's, it's a considerable, you look great. <laughs> you living, John. Thanks, Tara. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan, John, and everybody for uh, your opening remarks and for being here. When, when John and I were putting uh, this discussion together, as we all know, it's, it's a pretty large area, like where do you start? And, and so I think maybe for the panelists and, and, and for this, the participants rather, to hear from the panelists about that. So, and let me just start with Dave, if, if I could, and then obviously expand it to the other panelists as well. So when you think about, and you, you described Dave, you know, the really long history that, that PepsiCo has in this area, um, you know, when we were talking, we look at where ESG compliance is today and the speed and the exponential growth as to where we were 15, 20 years ago with the FCPA, right? Where people are really um, starting to see the importance, seeing it in their business lines, their labor force, et cetera, but kind of how do you start? So I think Dave, if you wouldn't mind just um, talking a little bit about how a company like yours, a, a company takes this issue and, and boils it down to, a, is it a risk assessment? Is it, how do they start getting their arms wrapped around the challenge and the opportunity here. Yeah, thanks, Tara, and uh, and kudos to the comments from all my panelists. Because as I said before, I think it takes uh, everybody holding hands and trying to, you know, uh, to torture a series of analogies, you know, pull on an oar, uh, keep keep everything going forward. But look for I think for for any company, in particular ones that work cross border, uh, as you have on the panelists today just building the infrastructure, you know, for this kind of thing and, and galvanizing an organization amidst all the other priorities that a business has at any point in time is, is really a big effort. As I mentioned, you know, Indra Nui, you know, put us on this path. I think with the foresight and knowledge that this whole wave was coming and, and not unlike Indra's uh, general strategic aptitudes, you know, she was a decade or so you know, ahead of, you know, the global trend, not ahead of everybody in the world, but ahead of what, you know, we see today, which is just, a, 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 as the John uh, uh, just mentioned, you know, it's been a wave here in the last five years of different initiatives and efforts and stuff. So when we went on the path, um, I'm not sure, you know, that we knew entirely what it was going to be, um, but sometimes the first step is the hardest to take, uh, but it's the most critical. And, and we were fortunate, frankly, to take that step back in 2006. Yeah, I had the benefit then of seeing a new CEO come in two years ago. And at that time, because I've been enrolled a little over three years now, um, where I'm part of the, the executive committee, and I got to see that newly formed executive committee under a new CEO sit down in the first couple of days of a CEO's tenure to say, hey, who are we as PepsiCo and what do we care the most about in terms of where we're going to um, apply our greatest strategic uh, oomph? You know, our, our, where are we going to allocate resources? Where are we going to put our time and, and energy? And there's a lot of things on that list that any company uh, will debate. There's competition. There's, uh, hey, what's our market for products? What's our R&D? What, uh, what do our people need? How many people do we need? There are, there, it's very, very, very hard to be a board or to be a CEO 
and sift through the vast multitude of potential priorities and then try to balance the allocation of resources. Um, what was very notable to me in this exercise now, probably two years ago, a little over two years, was to sit in the room um, and watch all the business leaders. And Sally was right, it, it takes a lot of different people in an organization, whether it's HR or legal or whomever, to um, you know, galvanize, galvanize around this. But what's critical is that you have the business leaders, you know, that you have the people that are controlling capital allocation, that are controlling the business agenda, and what are they gonna put on their list of top priorities? And frankly, you know, sustainability in the ESG space was squarely in the key priorities that we were gonna focus on for the next, you know, this duration of the CEO's tenure and this management team's tenure, which was a continuation of where Indra had brought us, but it was great to refresh it and ultimately even prioritize it very distinctly. And that's why um, it, it was great to be in the room, but it, it, it's, I would just say that it's important for a company to, to appreciate that this is going to be one of the top three, four, five priorities, name the number, but it's got to be in that top list. And then ultimately you have to, um, you got to build like any other business strategy that you want to integrate throughout your organization. You have to build the internal governance infrastructure. You need leadership. You need tone that comes out of the board, that comes out of the CEO, that comes out of appointing senior executives to oversee the area. That means building a department around it. That means uh, building a team that has goals, that has accountability, that ultimately translates into reports um, and frankly, you know, performance reviews and compensation decisions for the individuals that are overseeing this area. And ultimately, with time, you see this becoming more and more embedded, as I've seen at PepsiCo since 2006, but certainly, you know, um, increasingly over the last five years, embedded into the business decisions that run through, hey, where are we going to put a new facility? Hey, are we going to build this facility as a as a green facility or not? Um, you know, how, what people are we going to hire and retain and promote, et cetera? What products are we going to go through R and D? What are our M and A considerations? Are we going to walk away from certain deals and certain geographies that run a business a certain way? Are we going to pull away and just not even touch that from an acquisition possibility to capital expenditure decisions? Where you know, what, how much of our money, which is limited, are we going to put up against the ESG priorities? Uh, to make sure that we're driving on that agenda the same way that we might be driving on one of the other agendas within our business. And ultimately, through all that, with a little bit of extra training, et cetera, it becomes a culturalized. It becomes in the business. It's no longer this thing called sustainability. It's how we run. It's a really part of your daily operation. Uh, and that's what, uh, you know, I'm proud to say, you know, we have, we have a long way to go. There's still things that we have to do better. Uh, but it's truly in our culture. Um, and that's easy for organizations to say. Uh, but when you walk through kind of the checklist of things, and then ultimately from an, you never really know from the outside looking in, but when you're inside a company and I hazard to guess, you could ask anybody within PepsiCo, uh, whether this is squarely in the key priorities, you'd get a yes. And it, that, that's all very hard to do. And the bigger the organization, more complex the organization, including my fellow panelists on this call, all attest that that's hard to do. Yeah, definitely. Sally, I see you nodding. I mean, anything you'd want to add to David's observations? I mean, I, a thousand percent endorse everything and agree with everything Dave said. And what I, maybe what I'll add is not all companies are as forward thinking and as proactive as Pepsi. And so if you are at a place where you may need to bring people on board and start reaching out to your business leaders and start to you know, educate and explain why this is critically important this, um, from the human rights perspective in particular, I think people understand sometimes the environmental and sustainability and deforestation a little easier sometimes than the forced labor parts of it. Um, but I can add, look at your customers and their requirements, see where they are going. If you are doing business with a Walmart, a McDonald's, a Pepsi, a Nestle, um, companies that are operating at extremely high standards, um, and have those expectations of their supply chain, that is also a great way to sell your business on the importance of these programs. And we just see continual improvement um, at these large corporations who have very high expectations and that's something um, to keep in mind as well. And another, another thing I would add is um, at Tyson, I also helped uh, administer the enterprise risk management program 
And I think through some of those more formal risk assessments, whether it be at the enterprise level or at the business unit level, um, you will see sustainability and some of these other topics rising up. And those are also great um, levers to pull um, to help everybody in the organization understand how critically important they are. And, and as you're tracking this over time, you can also see you know, increased risk, um, likelihood risk, all of that going up. And that helps give a little ammunition to help with your CapEx and other types of decisions. Yep, thanks, Sally. Um, and, and Manuel and Gloria, um, how did you approach from this perspective of starting to, to build your ESG compliance framework and program? Well, uh, there are uh, different uh, perspectives, you know, from the strategy, which is part where we, we can get uh, you know, started from our sustainable development uh, policy uh, and our mission, which is to add value to non-renewable resources in a sustainable way. If we start a mission, you know, you can uh, start making different strategies and creating these corporate structures and, you know, uh, and, and how to create a compliance uh, framework, you know. So uh, talking about our sustainable development policy, which is public, and 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 the, and the web and, and Peniola's web page and our uh, and our sustainability uh, reports and annual reports uh, view to were listed to uh, we're, we're a public company listed in Mexico Stock Exchange so it's really important to uh, keep clear about about uh, which efforts we're performing on this on this kind of topic so uh, talking about sustainability development policy it establishes guidelines for warranty productive safe and environmentally respectful operations based of culture uh, of prevention to care for the health ecosystems in harmony with, uh, with communities. So this is possible by means of comprehensive sustainable development management system and for continuous improvement, not only to ensure to meet our commitments to customers, but the whole stakeholders and the whole environment we are uh, being, uh, you know, developed again. So uh, we, we have uh, six different steps in order to get through this sustainability strategy, which is the adoption and practice of a sustainability strategy, a comprehensive approach that warranties productive operations with high performance in environmental, social, uh, safety and health matters. All those are different components of, the, of that strategy. C creation of a clear and organizational structure and clear definition of roles and responsibility. It is quite important. It's not only you know to have the good intention, but to have a corporate structure to uh, help to coordinate different efforts to the different, uh, uh, you know, divisions and operations and locations through the company. Uh, as you know, if you uh, see from the focus of the three lines of defense, uh, this, this structure is as the second life, uh, line of defense, which leads the, the efforts of the operations which are part of the first line of defense, which are located in the different business units and divisions uh, 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 we perform. So uh, this supervision, overseeing and audit efforts, for instance, is part of, of a tree line of defense, which is a different instance from our corporate structure. So it's really important to have uh, a clear uh, a structure of roles and responsibility. And uh, you know, uh, to be added to international standards, for instance, uh, uh, those uh, wh which come from the United Nations. Uh, here in Mexico, we have the Mexican uh, federal labor law, uh, which covers this kind of topics, the immigration law, and, and its first articles, for, for instance, considers uh, human trafficking. And, and different standards that might that, that might arise uh, from 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 external, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, associations, for instance, like the London Bullion Market or the World Gold Council. You know, those different standards from the our supply chain, and uh, you know, frequently and regular uh, internal and independent audits. So, from the compliance efforts, is really important, you know, to get through. Uh, uh, mapping these different obligations to, you know, to find the gaps of this compliant and non-compliant, you know, with uh, uh, with these standards, with these regulations, you know, but you know, but in a, in a complete universe, in a whole picture, and which are the risks we are exposed on the uh, uh, if you don't, you know, uh, take actions into these standards and things you 
you have all over the gaps you have found it so there's a, a you know sustainable uh, a structure there's another uh, structure we have which is focused on uh, on communities there's a there's a, a specific structure for communities and which is you know uh, the communications with uh, about education healthcare social development matters there's diagnosis there's a complete strategy about uh, what's the perception of the communities we're working along with uh, which are uh, uh, you know the uh, how we'd be performing our efforts if they're well perceived if the, if something doesn't uh, you know, to, to create different uh, action plans. And, you know, from the compliance perspective, uh, uh, there's a compliance structure here in, in Pinoles, which is in charge of, you know, uh, uh, overseeing and supervising the, the, the diversity, all of these strategies are going on from a risk-based perspective. So that's the way uh, I can tell you uh, we're, uh, you know, undertaking different efforts to keep uh, evolving and to keep improving and, of course, adapting to uh, this international demands uh, that, uh, that we really have. Thanks, Manuel. That's very helpful. And, and a number of you have picked up on a number of themes which we'll drill down on, testing, monitoring, certainly very much among them, the whole checks and balances in an effective compliance program. One thing I thought, and maybe Jonathan, you could, could kick us off is, and Dave, Dave also talked about it, which is you know, setting metrics, milestones, measuring performance against it, that, that can be a pretty um, significant or, or overwhelming thought, like how you bake that all into it. But you, you Jonathan, have the, um, obviously the experience of advising a lot of these um, organizations that think about metrics and think about measurements and then on the corporate side and, and as we advise clients, kind of how you set those and how you uh, set the metrics and how you measure performance. Do you want to take a moment and address that? Yeah, sure. No, ha happy to. Um, so I, I think when you look at uh, performance, you look at metrics, really, they're, they're, they're two separate but related areas. So metrics are obviously things that you ultimately follow and track to assess um, progress in, in any given area or to measure something while, while a performance commitment at KPI is how you're judging your overall performance against something. And, and in, in the ESG space, you, you know, you, you are increasingly seeing um, companies not only using, but reporting on uh, both metrics, the key tracking metrics that they're using, as well as their key performance initiatives. And quite frankly, it's becoming a growing expectation among shareholders, stakeholders, internally senior management, as well as boards to hear about uh, the key metrics and, and performance, as well as uh, the overall um, a performance of the program. And my advice on, on these issues is, number one, think about what you're already tracking. I identify those areas where you can capture and integrate issues that other areas of the business are already collating, number one. Number two, um, don't be afraid to start small. You got to start somewhere. So, you, you know, get started and, and, then they, and, they, and you can grow them uh, logically over time. It is critically important if you want to try to um, get internal buy-in if you want to demonstrate performance, if you want to um, show different business units how they are performing against each other, but it, it, it also is something that you, you want to be reporting and tracking in the same way that other areas of the business are doing it. And so one of the things that you, you do see with ESG programs, with human rights programs um, that I always suggest is, you know, you act as as dave was saying you need to act like another area of the business you need to act like maybe it's safety and health for mining or environment uh, for mining or or food safety if we're talking about a, a a food company you need to present your metrics and your program in a way as the rest of the business does if you want to get that respect if you want to be treated like you are part of the business if you want to continue to get budget which is always a, a significant issue um, act like part of the business, which means uh, reporting on your metrics and your key performance uh, uh, initiatives. Into here. Great. Yeah, and, and you know, one thing, John, I, I think that was very, um, that's very insightful. And I think everybody should be aware that you know, there is no, um, right now, right now in ESG, there's no universally adopted standard for how to, 
companies can measure and report on these types of things. And so the fact that each of these companies are approaching it differently and that they're doing things to set up ways to measure it are really important. And I think it takes, once again, it goes back to the theme of taking a village. I'm interested, Sally, um, uh, if you could maybe touch on this a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, your experience with this. And also, um, I think you guys at, at, at Tyson Foods set up a, a, a steering committee and, and some of these areas. Maybe speak about that and, and how you, you measured, um, you know, you, how you did testing and monitoring and auditing of those things as well. Sure. Um, I agree with John, you have to start somewhere. And so a few very just kind of nuts and bolts, practical things that we did in terms of testing is continually to monitor and assess the calls that we get to our ethics helpline on these issues. Um, Tyson has uh, perhaps a unique or a very proactive program in place for our domestic hourly workers that uh, is a questionnaire that is administered at the time of hire to look for forced labor indicators. And so that is another um, metric that we track and follow um, so that we can see, do we have false positives? Do we actually have uh, community members or, you know, heaven forbid, but te sometimes team members who are taking advantage of other team members. So those are some things that we have in place. We also, um, will track, um, you know, following our internal audit, our, the results that they have and other audits that are done across the company and taking that information and digesting it cross-functionally as a way to, again, continually assess and monitor what we see is happening in other parts of the company and how it may impact these ESG or human rights topics and programs that we have in place. And I should add, I know we may talk about this later, but another very significant prop program is the social compliance audit program, which again is something along with the ethics helpline is um, an ongoing program. Um, it is something that is an audit that is performed regularly or periodically at all of the facilities. Um, and then we could talk about whether you go down your supply chain and how many levels you go down, but just focusing on uh, Tyson as a company for a moment. Um, these audits, for those who may not be familiar with them, focus on typically four pillars, um, business integrity, environment, human rights, and um, health and safety. And those are, again, independent auditors come in very uh, easy to track, easy to understand whether you have issues or you do not. And the Tyson as a company reports those along with its helpline data in its sustainability report, as well as sharing those with customers who ask for the, the information. So those are a few very practical ways that companies can do a monitoring and, and testing and assessment. Fantastic, yeah, and I, I know that, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, development in this area, and, and I think this is very valuable for a lot of the attendees to, to understand how other folks have used um, their resources to track and to audit and to look at that and also the outside resources. So that, that's interesting that you guys do that. Um, I wanted to pivot and ask Sister Ann a question um, because I thought this is a pretty good time. Sister Ann, now, does your organization provide training and services to companies and organizations? And also, how do you partner with companies and organizations? I know we talked a little bit about that. Um, maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Yes, we do. Which, whatever companies would like information, we certainly provide education. We know that everybody needs the basics to understand what this issue is, how complex it is, how large it is, and they need to know who are the victims, who are those who may be doing the trafficking. A little bit about the laws. Most need to know that this is a crime, so there are laws. And then what do you do? What can you do as an individual, as a corporation uh, to address it locally, nationally, or even internationally? So. Uh, it will depend on what the company needs. We know everybody needs the basics, but then companies may have specific needs based on the types of work that they do. 
So for instance, I would do something very different for healthcare professionals than what I would do for the hotels in our area. Uh, or for, from, for Travel America, which is right across the street from us. They have different needs. And so what's the nature of the business? And what specifically are the concerns that the uh, employees and perhaps the board and the leadership want to know about? So it, it requires some research. It requires some uh, planning with one another to design what's most important for the the company to do and um, work it out that way. We know everybody needs the basics though, because if they don't even think it's happening, then we can't begin to make any difference. Uh, excellent. And and as far as um, companies that you've partnered with, I know that there's some, some organizations that have done a lot to help you and then that you work closely with. And so, um, you know, can you speak a little bit about that as well? Yes, we've worked with some companies because they've invited us to. Lincoln Electric is one of the ones that we worked with and they do welding. It's international. They do welding and welding supplies and those kinds of things. They were especially concerned about cybersecurity and the interaction between cyber things and human trafficking. And we know so much of human trafficking is happening online as opposed to in terms of sex trafficking on the streets as it used to be. So they wanted to know about that. They wanted to know how they could do a better job with their employees, but also in terms of their business and who, who are they partnering with and what are the labor practices of the people that who, with whom they partner so that they can make better decisions about that. We've worked with the hotels in the area a lot to determine what are the best practices that they want to have in place so, because they know human trafficking is not at all good for their business. So what is it that we need to do with their employees? And so we designed programs with them, 30 minute in-person programs, not happening right now, of course, in person. Um, and they wanted large posters of what are the suggested best practices if you see the red flags, if you identify something that makes you very uneasy about what could be going on in the facility. And so having those big posters in the workroom and knowing whom to call has become very important for them. We've worked as well with healthcare significantly because the health systems in, in the greater Cleveland area are the big players like Cleveland Clinic and uh, University Hospitals and Metro Health, big players. And St. Vincent Charity is another one of those. Together, we formed what are the best practices when you see patients coming in who you think could have been trafficked? How do you recognize that? How do you respond? So, and came up with common guidelines. Now this was five years ago, nobody was doing this. Um, it, we wanted them to be common because these are great competitors, these big health systems. We wanted it common for wherever you go in Cleveland area, this is what, how people will be treated. So it's an ongoing process. People need to educate every staff person about how to respond from their particular work situation. Whom do you call and what are the next steps? So yeah. that is an ongoing effort as well. So those are some of the people. Um, Travel America, right across the street, as I mentioned, uh, very concerned about making sure that their travel facilities along highways are paying attention to people who could be being trafficked and brought through there. And they have partnered very closely with Truckers Against Trafficking to uh, make sure that the people they employ and the, the, their posters in their facilities so that people know how to respond, that they don't have to continue to uh, be suffering in this manner. Um, so giving people some sense of, I, I could get out of this. There are people who want to help me if I know even what it is. They don't, the uh, victims often don't even know what's happening to them. So those are some of the ways that we've been working on these things. Thank That's you, Sister, and that, and you talk about so, so many important, also just um, kind of in, inherent features of, an effective compliance program, which is building awareness, right? Understanding what the red flags are, giving people a reporting mechanism. What happens if you, 
you think you see something, you don't necessarily have to be right, it's okay. But if you have a concern, how do you handle it? And really communicating that you have, as you were talking about the human trafficking, we have it here in the United States. We see it in global operations, modern slavery, child labor. I mean, you see it a lot. And so really building a, in that awareness and the internal framework and easy steps for employees and third parties and vendors to follow if they see something, which is so critical. And, and I, I'd like to just follow that up a little bit, Dave, and talk, you know, the whole focus on supply chain, right? And, and large companies, as all of you, you have these huge supply chains. How do you address ESG and human rights priorities of PepsiCo in your supply chain? And because you are global, and what we found um, even in the beginning of rolling out ABAC compliance programs is there's also this whole level of effort uh, consistent with what Sister Ann was saying, educating vendors, educating suppliers, because they come oftentimes with different legal, cultural, regulatory frames of reference. So can you talk a little bit about that? I'd love to open it up to the other panelists. Yeah, sure. My, you know, my first thought and, and uh, perhaps where John uh, Drimmer was saying just a few minutes ago was, you know, whether you're taking your first step or your millionth step in this, this journey of wherever you are, it's a good day to take a step. Um, and I think that's really the nature of the supply chain question too, Tara. And I, I would just suggest to everybody that th the world is far different than it ever used to be. In the days of kind of wishing away uh, bad things that are going on in the world, hoping that you, within the context of your business, don't have to worry about that or don't have to focus on it. Those are gone. There's too much transparency. There's too much um, cross-border connectivity going on in the world. And so to the extent that you know you're, you haven't taken your first step, uh, today's a good day to take a first step because you're going to have to start taking those steps, whether for compliance reasons, as you're hearing about in relative to some of the laws, but just the, the ethical expectations um, are higher than they've ever been and they're not coming back. Uh, so we're in a different era. Now, relative to supply chains, Terry, you raise a great point because I think, you know, if, if I, you know, um, I talked to some retired executives, you know, that left PepsiCo 10, 15 years ago and they romantically remember the days where just kind of finding the lowest price for the widget that they needed to procure in their role uh, was their main objective. And, you know, the how of uh, that pricing scheme and how the supplier delivered it at such a low price was hardly their concern, frankly, back in 70s, 80s, probably early 90s and beyond, we're, we're different. And so, you know, the, the hard part now is up against, you know, for us, at least at PepsiCo, we are largely an agricultural procurer. Uh, we buy a lot of equipment and machines and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, we're really an agriculture company because we, we buy a lot of corn and potatoes and um, you know, sugar and oranges and oats and stuff and so and, and oils as well. Uh, and all those things come out of the ground. And so for us, you know, getting into the supply chain, not just to the supplier of the finished, you know, ingredient or product, but ultimately down to the farm level um, was a, an exercise in building out infrastructure to be able to do that. And that's why it does take a while to get, especially with a supply chain that's as localized and global as ours is, it's a real challenge. And so you have to have a real commitment to understand that this is critical to the sustainability of the company. I mean, it's interesting to talk about the human rights of the people. We can all care about that, uh, and we do. Uh, ultimately, companies have to really internalize that if they don't do this, they're going to be left behind. I mean, they're really good. Their products are not going to be purchased. The consumer cares. You know, in our world, we hear a lot from our consumers about their care. So we've had to build the infrastructure. We've had to build the, um, the vetting system for our suppliers up front. We've had to build the questionnaires and expectations, frankly, uh, as Sister was saying, it, it's good to be able to get an industry operating together because it creates aggregate pressure on the supply base that's trying to sell their products farther up the food chain to consumer companies in our, in our case. Uh, so that to the extent that you can get industry norms of what the expectations are in your supply chain, which is what has been helped by having some global principles, some global guidelines and standards, et cetera, ultimately creates pressure to go farther, deeper and broader into the supply chain. And then it's up to companies like us to execute and ultimately enforce that and be willing to walk away from suppliers that aren't complying. And that's absolutely what we do. And if you're not willing to pull the plug on a supplier and fire them for a lack of compliance because they're forcing labor or they're, you know, they're using child labor in some market or, or frankly, their, you know, their deforestation principles just aren't consistent with our expectations. You have to be willing to walk away and that's putting your money where your mouth is and stuff. So it's got to start with the goals, the principles, the beliefs, the values. You got to build the infrastructure to get deeper and to be able to 
test your suppliers up front and then audit them on the back end and then ultimately make the tough decision um, that they're out and you're going to have to go find something else. And by the way, when you have to go find something else, it's going to be more expensive. So unless you have this built into your business ethos, because doing things right typically costs more money. So unless you build it into your ethos, you'll never have the guts to ultimately terminate that supplier unless you really have the, the tailwind of your principles behind it. And you got to be prepared for that um, right, right from the start. Yeah, yeah, great points. Manuela, Gloria, anything you'd want to add in on that, on this uh, subject of the supply chain? Yes, of course. So um, in the extractive industry, because of uh, its nature, its complexity, its large inflows of capital, uh, it is particularly prone to all of these kind of risks, uh, corruption, fraud, supporting um, indirectly money laundering. Uh, there's also the risk in the mining sector of receiving uh, mineral concentrate, concentrate that is sourced for sanctioned countries or that it's sourced from high risk territories. So um, this is uh, very complex. Uh, and fortunately, Peñoles uh, refinery, uh, the, the volume that it is received, approximately 70% of this volume, it's sourced from Peñoles mines, which of course comply with uh, all industry standards and regulations. So the main risk are, the main risk in the supply chain, of course, is uh, linked to third parties. So how do we assess that risk? We um, are adhered to the LBMA Responsible Sourcing Program. This program is specific to the mining industry and it sets standards to have a very comprehensive, very strong due diligence procedure that uh, helps avoiding uh, contributing to conflict contributing to money laundering, terrorists, and abuses to human and labor rights. And since 2019, this program also reinforces the importance of strong corporate governance and addressing environmental and sustainability issues. So Peñoles has a very strong due diligence policy, and uh, it also um, asks for some uh, third-party categories to uh, perform on-site visits and we also are, another effort that the company is doing is that right now it is, uh, the third party code of conduct is, develop, is in development and it will be released in 2021. And this will set the expectations that the company has regarding third party behavior. And will, uh, it's an effort to be uh, linked with strategic partners that share Peñoles commitment commitment with responsible business and integrity. Thank you very much. That's great. Hey, Sarah, um, I would just, I just oh, it's, it's off of what Gloria was just saying, you know, you, you develop a supplier code of conduct as uh, I'm sure many of the companies do. You have a supplier code, you know, you then link it into your contract with your suppliers so that ultimately if they violate that, you can terminate it as I was saying before. So it's a big uh, interconnected loop, you know, of activities and driving your values down to your supply chain and standing behind it. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Dave. Absolutely right. Um, I was going to say, why don't um, we just see here on the supply chain issue from Sally and Jonathan, I didn't know if you wanted to expand a little bit on what we're seeing, particularly coming out of the EU on kind of driving the focus on supply chain. Um, and then we can move on to some other topics as well. Sally, can there have been some great points already made. I think I just add that what Gloria described is where we see the evolution of third party due diligence heading, which is a holistic look at risk, um, not just looking at corruption risk or not just looking at IT risk, um, but, but identifying the key risks supplier and doing a holistic look either at the time of uh, of engagement or renewal, or you know, depending on where you're at in your program of amendment of contracts, but you you don't have to wait, you know, but it, take that first step. But I do think that's where companies are going, and I think with COVID, also we've seen the importance of also just understanding business continuity risk, and that's going to be part of the holistic look at due diligence for companies to the extent they weren't doing it before going forward, they certainly will be. 
Yeah. And, and um, that what's interesting too, is, is where we are in the journey kind of writ large, right. Is to also be driving that obligation for your third parties to participate in those types of compliance audits, right. We used to get a lot of pushback on the ABAC side, right. But pulling them along with you, Jonathan Drummer, before we shift over in topics, I just didn't know if you wanted to add anything more on the whole issue of supply chain, given some of the, the developments, particularly coming out of, uh, the EU. Yeah, no, very happy to, 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 to Sally's point, you know, we are seeing that holistic approach. You're seeing on the one hand, as we've talked about today, ESG and human rights as its own separate set of activities, but also the integration of ESG and human rights into other areas of risk and compliance. And so that holistic approach really does make sense, which is a nice segue into the EU uh, issue that's going on right now in terms of their uh, legislative directive. And we have a pre-draft of a corporate due diligence accountability um, directive that, that is, we imagine is going to be introduced formally next year. We've seen the pre-draft. We think it's probably going to be adopted maybe 12 months from now, somewhere, somewhere in that vicinity. And then two years after for uh, states to ultimately adopt their implementing legislation. And it is a transformative uh, responsible business conduct law, much in the way that we were just talking about it, not only includes companies, but also their suppliers, their subsidiaries, uh, their business relationships more generally. It includes human rights, it includes environmental issues, it includes governance issues, which is not just anti-corruption, but also tax evasion and undue political influence and illegal campaign contributions. Companies are going to have to go through diligence exercises, identify the risks they've found, identify the process they use. They're going to have to have details about their supply chain, the steps that they're taking, um, not only internally, but to influence their suppliers, much in the way that we were uh, just talking about. And for larger companies, the current proposal is that they're going to have advisory boards uh, for their uh, board committees and for um, management to carry out these due diligence efforts. So it's a, a holistic and dramatic approach towards responsible business conduct due diligence, but also human rights related due diligence. So putting into place remedial measures, controls, reporting, identifying effectiveness. Um, it, it really, assuming that it comes into place much in the way that we are seeing it now, it really will be transformative uh, along the lines that we actually are talking about on, on this conversation. Great. You know, and I wanted to mention one thing too, you know, at Integrity Risk, we've seen more and more an increased emphasis on these types of topics and looking at due diligence in a more holistic type of uh, a perspective. A lot of our clients are more interested in, uh, in, in the ESG component of the businesses that they're looking at, that they're looking at, who they're looking at working for on the front end. And so I do think that that's a, um, you know, a growing trend. It used to be just the investment firms and now you see more and more yeah, you see every company looking at this and evaluating. And to Dave's point, um, Dave, David, um, one of the things that you said is, you know, you, you need to have these perimeters in place before you start doing business because it is going to be more expensive to break away from that. And if you don't build the landing gear before you try to land the plane. So I, I really think that's an important Thing to emphasize and to start convincing the, the powers that be within your organizations that uh, you need to take these steps in the, on the front end so you know what you're dealing yeah. with. Yeah, very much. And, and also, as we talked about, it's the interconnectedness of these compliance related issues and challenges, um, but also the fact that you can scale it, right? Like you, you as I think Jonathan, somebody said, you know, it's all of us take the first step, right? Because it can seem, I think, and feel overwhelming. But if you take it through a, a thoughtful plan of action, um, it is it is doable. Sally, one thing I wanted to make sure we touched upon, and I just want to ask everybody in the um, audience, the participants, to please um, go ahead and send. We've got two questions, which we're going to turn to right after Sally's uh, uh, remarks. Um, uh, but please put in the Q and A, and we're happy to ask your questions. Um, Sally. I, I know the whole the whole issue of kind of steering committees and how to cascade that organizationally. Um, you've had a great experience uh, and, and insight there. Do you want to just take a minute and then we'll turn to the um, participants' questions? Sure, thanks. And Dave described board level committees, and that is key. I mean, if you can get your board there, um, on that's a that's the first step. Um, but then also at your operational level. 
um, steering committees can really be an important tool to help uh, coordinate um, activities in these areas. As what we have, what I've seen before is you have um, HR looking at like helping on medical parts. You've got corporate social responsibility doing outreach in communities. You have translators who are in your facilities off helping individuals. I mentioned the chaplains. You have ethics and compliance and law doing a piece. And it's really important to bring all of those people together who are working with the best of intentions and really with that same goal in mind um, to set your priorities because as we said, you can't do everything. We don't have resources for everything, but to set priorities, understand what the biggest risks in this area are and make sure you're swimming together um, in a coordinated, efficient fashion. And the steering committee is a, a part of governance that can help drive that efficient use of resources and prioritization of action across the company. Yep, thank you. Great points all. Let me ask um, this first question um, from Carolyn. Uh, could the panelists speak to how their respective companies work to develop and implement remedy with affected workers and communities when human rights violations are identified? Anybody want to take that? No? I can uh, I can jump in, or if anyone else doesn't want to go first, go but uh, a couple of uh, points on that. I think it depends on whether the bio, the violation that you've identified involves your company or just someone else in the community. Um, if it is somebody in your company who then you have the remedial measures that you would take disciplinary measures, et cetera. There's always the option uh, of referral to law enforcement, um, whether it's a violator is inside or outside of the company. But one thing that we have seen is that when we've done these questionnaires and have uh, indicators of potential forced labor, um, it's not being conducted by anyone at Tyson, but it's somebody else in the community. And so that's where your relationships with those trusted uh, community uh, liaisons come into place. Um, some of what uh, Sister Ann was talking about, but to have people that you can reach out to in the community to help these team members in addition to any referrals you, know, you may make to law enforcement because um, you can do so much within your company, but you can't always control everything. So having that reach out, I think is, is very important. And I also think that um, and suggest that if you do have violators inside your company, um, it is key to take swift and very you know, strong action and to make clear um, that the company, this is not the company's position, this is you know, a rogue wrongdoer and we do not put up with this type of conduct at all. And so you know, immediate termination, other, other steps that may be needed, but it's important to send a strong message very quickly. Thank you. Anybody else? Jonathan? Yeah, I, I think um, what I have generally seen, what I've seen, and I've done a, a lot of work on remedy, uh, both before Paul Hastings and, and at Paul Hastings, is it definitely depends, and it'll depend on the nature of the human rights issue, it'll depend on the severity, it'll depend on the, the, the remediability and irremediability, it'll depend on whether there's a criminal or legal component that is associated with it, everything that Sally said in, in terms of some of those other um, issues that can can create variation uh, in in remedy approaches and the UN guiding principles and and the and the commentary for the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights also provide different parameters in, in decision making that that are valuable. But but as a general proposition, now you you do talk about the importance of uh, number one consensual dialogue and engagement and engaging with affected uh, third parties to try to identify. Um, solutions that that are that make sense for them and that effectively restore them to the position where they were before, which may involve compensation, it may not involve compensation, it may involve apologies, it may involve other things. But one of the areas that's often not talked about, but it, it is included as as an issue in in the UN guiding principles, and it is consistent with with good and best practice, and we talk about it all the time in the anti-corruption space, is preventing reoccurrence and taking steps to figure out what the root causes are. So whatever led to the negative impact 
is addressed, is corrected, and and that recurrence obviously um, doesn't doesn't happen. So it, it it does depend on a lot of different factors, uh, but it is it is something again that consensual dialogue and preventing reoccurrence are 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 two of the critical elements. Thank you. Um, there's a question for Sister Anne from Michelle. What is the best approach an organization like the Collaborative can take or offer to large corporations to begin to partner with and address this specific issue? Well, I would again say the first step is educating the members, whoever they may be, board, uh, senior leadership, all the employees, to understand what this issue is, why it's so uh, much of a concern and what to do about it. Um, and there be, depending on the kind of organization and the, the kind of work being done, there may be many strategies for dealing with it, but understanding the issue is the first thing. And the other thing would be identifying who else in the community helps with this because no organization can do it alone. You have to have lots of kinds of different skills around the table to begin to address the, the issues of prevention, yes, and of service to those who have been trafficked so that we can uh, meet the needs. So law enforcement has to know how to interact with those who may have been trafficked. It's not so easy. You don't do it like you see it on law and order. You have to have that sense of these people have suffered tremendous trauma. So how to interact with someone who has um, experienced that kind of trauma can be key or they're, they're not gonna open up, they're not gonna tell you anything. Uh, you have to have relationships with those who do translations if you don't have the language to interact with people who may speak a different language, have that available. The social service providers who provide acute intervention, but then what, what about long-term? What about the education that people need in order to get back on their feet? Um, what about employment opportunities? So it's a, it's a gamut of ways that companies can respond based on what they do and what their needs are. And, and then also seeing the connections of these other major issues. If we're dealing with environmental factors that are then causing migration, people who are immigrating or moving from their homes may be very vulnerable to the traffickers. So all the connections. Thanks. And then another one of, of course would be in our culture, US culture and probably some other, other development, developed countries, we are so bargain oriented. We're out for what's the cheapest thing. Never realizing that I got that t-shirt cheaply on the back of someone who was being trafficked. So raising all that awareness is key and uh, helping people understand all those connections I think is essential to beginning to get a handle on this. And so I, I'm pleased to see what the companies on this panel are uh, already doing. It's, it's a great um, booster for me to know that that's happening. Thank hey. you, Mr. Sorry, I was just gonna say, we have one more question and then we'll, we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, uh, Vlad asks, what types of tools, technology, and other tools are you using to monitor these behaviors in the supply chain outside of your own questionnaires or, or your own risk assessments? I don't know, Dave, are you, I mean, it might, it's a big topic in terms of it, technology. It, it, it is a big topic. I mean, the thing that I would say, if I think about our supply chain, you know, we've, we've always had, you know, the, uh, the accounts payable and accounts receivable. Then we climbed into due diligence. And, and candidly, what we found is that there was some financial due diligence being done in suppliers. Other people were doing anti-bribery, anti-corruption diligence. Other folks came along and were doing human rights diligence and stuff. And ultimately, we started viewing that more is almost like customer relationship management tools in terms of you know how to comprehensively log, track, follow up. We ultimately pile in audit results uh, into those so that there's a follow up uh, means of when we're going to schedule the next audit or follow up on remedial and remediation efforts and stuff like that. So I almost view it as something. Now there's a lot of tools out there these days for third party due diligence, but also third party management. And without going into too deep a detail, I'd almost focus on those. If you're looking for kind of one-stop shop, I think the software industry has kind of come along on this front uh, in pretty decent way in the last you know five years or so. Yeah, and the one point I would add that's not just for the supply chain, this discrete um, 
question, but it reminded me just as a caution, as you're thinking about how to um, do a risk assessment, how to audit, test, monitor, if you've grown at all by acquisition, then the different systems that you may have um, and whether they're really talking to each other and how well and effective they are in giving you that window and transparency into um, what's happening. And then of course you have the complexity with the supply chain on top of it. Um, so I'm gonna quickly check. I, we have only have five minutes. We do have a couple of other questions. So I just wanna see really quickly if we have time. Um, uh, what are some questions to ask on an audit to get out of about forced labor? Um, and, and, you know, audits, yeah, it, it, that's a hard one, right? Like how do you, in your audit, really have that detective uh, insight into uh, whether you have a forced labor issue and, and depending upon where you're doing the audit, what country, jurisdiction, kind of what constitutes um, forced labor locally too may be different than than your your definition. Anybody want to take that that on? I can jump in. I think Terry, you're exactly right that you have to have a baseline of what are your obligations at a minimum, your legal obligations where you're conducting the audit or asking these questions. So if you are in an area where holding um, identity papers is illegal you can ask a question to say, have you given anybody your papers? You could ask questions, did you have to pay anybody to get this job? You could ask questions about, um, did somebody pay for you to travel to the United States? And if so, how much did you pay and who did you pay? So there are legitimate organizations out there that help uh, fund people moving to the United States at a fair and reasonable uh, cost. Um, so you can also weed out some false positives that way too. Just depends exactly what you want to look for. And then you can ask some questions around that. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, well, we only have three minutes left. Um, I, I guess what I would offer to the participants who may have ongoing questions, please feel welcome to send them to John and me, and we're happy to try to find an answer for you, send you any, for instance, links. I know somebody asked about a link with regard to the EU draft directive, you know, anything of that nature, we're certainly happy to help out. I, I think what I would like to, to a note to um, end on is first and foremost, to thank the panelists for being with us today and for all of the participants to take time out to be with us. Thank you, you're all extremely busy, so we appreciate it. Um, as you've heard, if you haven't really been um, deeply engrossed in the whole developments of ESG and human rights compliance, I would also offer for your consideration that it also, which I think others on this panel have, have echoed, is an opportunity. It's also an opportunity to really um, give you, yourself, I think, a competitive advantage and really speak to the needs, um, desires of your employees if you look at the restatement of the purpose of a corporation, those five stakeholders are basically what we're talking about. We're talking about your employees, your vendors, suppliers, a local community, as well as your shareholders, of course. But on top of all of that, now that we have a new um, administration in the US coming um, in January, uh, we do anticipate that from a US perspective, there's gonna be increased focus and priority given to ESG both at the SEC, but far more broadly than that as well. A lot of regulatory agencies under a Biden administration are, are we are anticipating are going to, diversity and inclusion is a, is a very prominent one, but climate change is another big priority um, that's going to be there. Um, and the whole area of disclosure and ESD disclosures and what that looks like, the reporting and disclosure is a huge topic that we didn't have time to get into today. But so if you look at the landscape and the developments and you know, the announcement this morning out of the EU with the um, European Council and their demands on the European Commission starting in 2021, which is less than a month away, there is a momentum here that is, is accelerating. And so it is it's something that if you're a compliance professional or a legal professional, you should be focusing on this. And if you're on the business side, as others, Dave and others have said on this call, it is a business imperative. And it's really something that needs to be embedded into the fabric and the culture of your organization. So with that, I think, uh, John, any other closing remarks? 
Yeah, no, Tara, I think you did a great job. I, I would like to thank the panelists and the attendees. I think this was a great session. I think we should have more. Um, I think the topic, uh, I, I think we could have gone on for a, a lot longer, but I'd like to just say thank you for everyone and uh, have a great a afternoon and, um, you know, be ethical and diligent. <laughs> Thanks all. Take care. Good. Thanks, everybody.